Uh, thank you for coming here and listening to me. My name is Patrick Breyer. I'm a member of the European Parliament and um, pleased to be here with you to be able to discuss uh, the e-privacy reform and its pitfalls. Maybe to introduce myself, I'm a lawyer by profession and a long-time civil liberties activist. I've joined the um, a pirate party, which was founded in 2006 in Germany, but of course much earlier here in Sweden. And um, the reason for that was that um, this party um, is about protecting fundamental rights in the digital era, which um, I believe is extremely important in the course of the digital revolution. We need to make sure that our rights are not uh, restricted just because they can. Uh, with the technology that exists nowadays. So um, I have been elected to the European Parliament last uh, year and um, uh, there are four members of the Pirate Party in the European Parliament at the moment and we have joined the Green Zephyr group and the group has assigned me among others to um, negotiate um, the uh, e privacy reform whenever it uh, the Council can decides on taking a position, then we will be negotiating in the part of a trilogue. And I'm also responsible for the GDPR review, which um, will take place later um, this year. And um, so I hope that I can contribute a little to your knowledge on e-privacy and what it is about and what the um, points of controversy are. Why is there, why are there special rules on uh, the privacy in digital or electronic communications? The reason for that is um, in general data protection legislation, you will find some rules saying, um, you know, your data may be processed without your consent if there is a legitimate reason to do so, unless your interests override that interest. So there is a very general rule uh, that is not very specific and um, all sorts of interests can be legitimate including advertising and therefore um, it doesn't really uh, protect our information as well as we need in electronic communications because electronic communications is um, specifically susceptible to uh, interception and also to metadata analysis. So unlike us here speaking directly to one another, if you use um, electronic communications, then um, all along the way, and especially with the operators involved in the, com in the communication, it is possible to intercept communications without you ever knowing about it. And so the idea of secret of communications and um, protecting correspondence, just like with letters, just like with mail, is that um, people's privacy in corresponding and speaking to one another, communicating with each other, uh, should be no worse, uh, should be just as well protected as if though they were in the same room. So the mere fact that you need to use the post office or that you need to use your telephone operator shouldn't result in... Um, interceptability to a greater degree. And that's why there are specific rules to govern the um, privacy when you use electronic communication services. That can be the internet, it can be um, telephone, it can also be messaging services, uh, for example. And some of those rules also extend to um, using the internet, to um, tracking uh, cookies, um, that is the services that are covered by these um, rules on e-privacy. So the fact is that um, this information on our communications, and it's not just about content, it's also about um, where you are, who you have been in touch with, um, the metadata is extremely revealing. Um, it can reveal a great deal on your private life, also on your business uh, connections. Um, and it can also reveal uh, information that you may not be aware of yourself. 
Um, it can reveal a lot on your personality. It can reveal information on medical uh, conditions, on sexual preferences, depending on how, with whom you communicate, etc. PP, and that's why um, there is a higher level of protection for your electronic uh, communications. Currently, this protection is uh, warranted by a directive, which is called the e-privacy directive, and um, this directive um, basically says. Um, that there is a secrecy of communications. So in principle, nobody may intercept. The operators may not intercept the content of your communications. And it also says that um, the details on your communications, the metadata, may only be processed where it is necessary to, um, to um, transfer your message um, and also for billing purposes, uh, for example, subject to a few exceptions, um, national security, et cetera, PP um, can be, give rise to exceptions. By the way, I have a nice slide on the agenda of my little presentation today. I see it's not very long, but we will have some time for questions and answers, don't worry. So um, the um, existing e-privacy directive, which dates back to um, 2002. Um, so the, the latest revision of the e-privacy directive is taking place in 2002. Um, the scope of that has been extended um, in the European Communications Code, which will apply as of the end of this year. And um, that extends these provisions to over-the-top services, meaning, um, for example, messaging services um, or, um, you know, Skype, uh, WhatsApp, etc., um, will also have to will also be in the scope of these rules, uh, which actually results in great uh, problems for them because uh, so far they do intercept messages and analyze it and filter them, etc., and so um, they will have to adapt to these rules. However, um, with the negotiations on uh, GDPR uh, having been uh, completed, uh, there was the idea to overhaul the privacy directive as well and to replace it with a regulation. Um, yes, that would have some more additional rules with uh, some more protection maybe or some less protection in some areas. We'll discuss that um, in a minute. And this proposed um, e-privacy regulation has, has been um, uh, published by the Commission in 2017, three years ago. Uh, the European Parliament um, agreed on a negotiation mandate in October of 2017, so also more than two years ago. And the Council of Ministers uh, has still not managed to reach a common position on the Commission's proposal, and that's why it has been blocked for a long time. Um, I think the reason of that is probably that um, there's extremely heavy industry uh, lobbying uh, happening around this dossier, because when it comes to our electronic communications and specifically um, tracking on the internet, the interests of uh, operators, but also of advertisers, uh, advertising industry, uh, collides with privacy interests. And um, that is why um, there has been extremely intense lobbying around these files, especially in council, because council doesn't have any transparency rules. They, uh, maybe they do in Sweden, but um, there is no European law that would, um, you know, oblige um, staff of national governments to uh, publish lobby meetings or such like, and usually they don't. So that's why the council is where most of the lobbying has taken place. So the European Parliament's position on the proposal of an e-privacy regulation um, has made important amendments to the proposal to better protect our privacy. Um, you know, we have 
uh, data scandals and data breaches nearly on a daily basis nowadays. Our data on the internet is not safe at all. That erodes the protection of, of our fundamental rights, but also the trust of um, citizens in their privacy online. And so we need to react to that. It's, the current protection is clearly insufficient because what we see, especially on the internet, is that um, we are being tracked. Our every click, our every move is being tracked and um, used and exploited to um, advertise, but also for political purposes sometimes to manipulate us into buying things or voting people just to give an example. And that's why the parliament has made important adjustments to improve uh, protection of our privacy online. Well, they haven't made it, but they have proposed to do so. Um, one point is um, to introduce a do not track flag in terminal equipment, such as browsers, um, which would mean that um, your browser would ask you, do you want to be tracked? And um, if you say no, and I think in a survey about 90% of people have said no, um, then um, this would be um, communicated to all websites that, that you browse to. And they would, of course, have to, to respect this no as an objection and as a, an opt-out. And um, some browser manufacturers have already implemented this, some no longer do, because it's not actually being respected by um, website operators, and some never have. So that's why Parliament has proposed to have this in, in all um, equipment. Secondly, encryption. Parliament proposes to make um, transport encryption mandatory for telecommunications operators. Um, since we know, uh, since uh, the revelations by Edward Snowden that um, there is mass surveillance happening around the globe, our communications are being intercepted and analyzed by intelligence services and stored um, also um, without any suspicion of a crime. Um, so therefore, whenever our communications are being transmitted without encryption, um, they will be intercepted and exploited by intelligence services. So the parliament proposes to make um, transport in encryption uh, mandatory, uh, which is extremely important and necessary to safeguard the security of our communications and the confidentiality, and which means that at least from one operator to the other, uh, the communications would be encrypted. Would of course still allow for lawful interception at the operators themselves. Third example of what the amendments the parliament proposes say is tracking walls. Now, many websites uh, will only let you use the website if you agree to uh, being tracked, to being followed, and um, to information on your internet use being collected and used for ad advertising uh, purposes. Um, we don't think that um, this is an acceptable uh, practice to, to, to force people into agreeing and saying uh, you can't access this site unless you, you consent to do so. Because we don't think that this um, surveillance capitalism that we find on the internet is a viable and um, ethical business model. It is possible to do uh, advertising without tracking people, just as you will find in magazines or on television, you will find advertisements that are being placed without knowing uh, who's watching or reading them. So it is possible to have other business models, which would certainly reduce uh, the income. But um, we believe that um, nobody should be excluded from important information on the internet because they refuse to, to be tracked. So therefore, uh, Parliament, in a very tight vote, um, has uh, decided to um, support a ban on such tracking walls. Uh, websites would no longer, uh, website operators would no longer be able to make uh, the access to their um, site dependent on consent to, um, yes, uh, tracking your, your every uh, click. 
So you can now maybe understand that um, <laughs> why this regulation has been blocked uh, for a long time. Um, Council, and we know that because some texts have been have surfaced now and again, Council wants to move in the exact opposite direction. So they don't want to reinforce the protection of our privacy, but they actually want to water it down massively, which is why I have called their proposal deprivacy. I think it would be more fitting to what they're planning to do. And I will um, explain um, with some points uh, what they are trying to do, what they are proposing. But they haven't yet agreed, so there's still some time for improvement. For example, Council wants to exempt activities concerning security and defense from the entire regulation, which would mean that, um, you know, data retention. So the indiscriminate collection of all of our of information on all our communications, contacts, movements, um, and therefore um, very private and intimate life um, would be allowed if security and defense doesn't come under that, um, under the scope of the new uh, regulation at all, which is just completely unacceptable. Um, you may know that the European Court of Justice has ruled that blanket um, indiscriminate the data retention requirements violate our, our fundamental right to privacy. Um, and um, they have used the existing e-privacy directive to justify that because um, the opening for, for um, national legislation um, says that you can only deviate from the privacy rules if they are necessary and proportionate. And Court of Justice decided that um, blanket retention of data on people who are not even remotely suspected or connected to any criminal activity is excessive. So what they're trying to do is to bring this out of the scope of the legislation entirely, which would mean that the European Court of Justice would no longer be competent to even, uh, to even rule on um, national uh, data retention legislation. And um, that fact alone, that council is trying to, um, to reintroduce a, um, a measure of um, interference in our uh, fundamental rights that has been found unconstitutional and violating our fundamental rights, that alone is reason enough to um, uh, reject these attempts. But there's more to it. Council also wants stored communications out of the scope of this directive, which would mean Confidentiality is protected only while your message is being uh, transferred to the recipient. Once it is in their inbox, it could be intercepted. It's of course uh, not at all what um, the purpose of the idea of uh, secrecy of communications is about. Council also would like to limit uh, this instrument to users who are in the European Union. So. Whenever you move outside the union, even if you still use your operator, your email uh, provider, whatever, um, this protection will no longer apply. And that is contrary to the idea of privacy as a fundamental right. Fundamental rights are human rights, and they apply to everybody, um, no matter where uh, they are located. Furthermore, about metadata. Um, first of all, they open up the processing of metadata to consent without any limitation or protection. That means that operators would again be able to um, have consent clauses that they would require all customers um, to agree to, which is not acceptable, of course. Then council wants to allow for the processing of your metadata on the basis of very vaguely worded grounds such as network security, detecting technical faults, uh, security risks, attacks uh, uh, on the end user's equipment even, or any national legal obligation to safeguard public security, another backdoor to data retention legislation. Um, that 
Oh, that's actually not about on metadata. This would apply to content. So even the processing of your content by your provider without your consent would be permitted if your provider says, we do it for security purposes, we do it to prevent risks for yourself, protect your equipment, or we do it um, because there is a legal obligation in national law, which of course means that um, any provider can always find a reason to store your uh, communications. And as to your metadata, uh, the wording is even more far-reaching. So it would also allow to process metadata to stop the fraudulent or abusive use of communication services or to protect the vital interest of a natural person or even for statistical and research purposes. So even for statistical purposes, they want to allow for the processing of personal metadata, which uh, is nonsense because you don't need it for those purposes. And um, the problem with these um, grounds for processing is that the lack of safeguards. So there is no limitation to do that in specific cases. For example, when it says um, network security, the provider cannot only process data if it's needed to um, fend off an attack or to um, restore the functionality of their services, but they could do it all the time, arguing we could use it in the future if a problem comes up. Um, furthermore, um, the notion of processing which is used in these clauses applies even includes the transfer to third parties. Processing is not just the storage of data, but also transferring data. So if you just allow for processing, that would even include the transfer of your communications and information on them to third parties. There is no purpose limitation, meaning that if data is um, stored for internal purposes, there is nothing to prevent the police from accessing it as well, for example, right? So there is nothing to say in these provisions that they could, the data could only be used, could not be reused for other purposes. There are also no maximum time, time limits. Um, the only thing it says until the end of the period during which a bill may lawfully be challenged, which could be like, I don't know, three years maybe. Um, in Germany, I don't know about Sweden, what it is like. Um, so that much for um, the secrecy of communications and the metadata. An extremely disturbing addition the council wants to make is one on communications filters or censorship. So the council wants to allow communication services to process electronic communication data to prevent um, the, um, to detect, delete and report child sexual abuse material, which means that they would be allowed to filter your private messages and communications just to see if you are sending um, illegal images. And that's a bit like as if the post office was opening every letter just to check that there are no prohibited images in there. So don't be fooled by the purpose of, um, you know, um, child sexual abuse, which is a very serious matter and needs to be addressed, of course. But it's not proportionate to put everybody under a general suspicion and examine their private communications um, just because you think they may be, uh, that you, in fact, all of us, may be um, uh, offenders, which I find incredible um, to suppose to do that. And um, that's why I don't think that uh, filtering um, private communications is in any way acceptable. It sets an incredible um, precedent. And as I was saying, you know, you could just as well argue that the post office should be doing this. So I'm running out of time, so I have to skip a few points. Of course, they don't want the do not track technology in browsers. Uh, member states would like to be able to allow for intercepting messages for enforcing civil claims even. Um, 
They don't want users to be informed about security risks. So if data has been accessed unlawfully, um, the Commission had proposed that there should be information provided, which the Council wants to delete. They don't want to ban tracking walls. They don't want encryption requirements. So as I was saying, they want the exact opposite, deep privacy. So what will the next steps be on this dossier? If ever the Council agrees on a common position, and probably they, they, they may do so in the second half of the year, there will be a German presidency and a Germany is taking a middle position on, on this dossier, so they will probably be able to, to find some position, but it will still be, um, yes, um, extremely dangerous. The Parliament will, of course, have to decide, um, is a trilogue promising at all? So can anything come out of negotiations that will protect our privacy better and not worse than the current legal framework is? There is a good rapporteur, Birgit Sippel, from the Socialists and Democrats. Um, however, some points in the original proposal and even the position of the parliament are weak, especially in the processing grounds for metadata, as I was saying, are not very specific and lack safeguards. The council position on the other side is likely to be disastrous and there will be a lot of lobbying. And that's what we will have to take into account um, in the negotiations, whether it will at all be be possible to achieve a decent protection of our privacy online or whether we should rather uh, stick with the current rules that aren't so bad in my opinion. However, I would like in the remaining minutes to, to have some feedback from you and to hear your opinion and uh, questions. Yes, please. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to ask about your opinion in terms of cookie walls and tracking walls about the alternative rule for that if you as an individual can choose. So either I pay with my data or I um, pay with money or I don't pay at all. So I Yes, I know what you mean. So um, the data protection authorities are not agreed on this question, whether it is enough to give a choice of a paid subscription um, as an alternative. Um, the political discussion uh, turns around the question of what about those people who can't afford uh, to pay? Um, should we exclude them or should we force them to, to have to uh, accept the tracking? And that's why the Parliament proposal is um, not to um, allow a paid subscription as an alternative um, to consent. Um, um, however, I know that there are other arguments saying that um, people should should have to, to pay for services. And uh, it is clear that if no tracking means that um, the revenues will go down, then obviously it would mean that um, some services could no longer be operated or would have to be reduced. So that is a political choice that needs to be uh, made. Um, how much our privacy um, is worth and um, whether we would accept that those who can't uh, pay for a subscription um, would basically have to agree to their privacy being exploited, which I think is very problematic. That's why um, a parliament wants to, to ban these tracking walls. And um, I think if it is a rule that is uniform for all of industry, then nobody is put at an advantage and everybody would um, start looking for, um, for alternatives. Of course, nobody can be forced to put out information at all. So if uh, newspapers, for example, decide that um, they only want paid subscriptions, they can, of course, do that. So it could result in less information uh, being available online. That's a possible consequence for sure. Yes, please. <laughs> That's a difficult question. The GDPR took years to negotiate and um, the negotiations really were only concluded after the um, Snowden revelations because there was a huge push and expectation um, of the public 
on politics to protect them against uh, such interferences. Actually, GDPR doesn't protect you from mass surveillance, but still, um, that was the reason why it was possible to agree on a good um, yeah, privacy framework. And we haven't had that yet for electronic communications. Well, we've had lots of um, cases that could have been uh, the trigger, such as Cambridge Analytica scandal, for example. Um, yeah, but the pressure hasn't been high enough. So um, some member states, I'm not sure if they want the regulation at all. Um, and also, as I was saying, Parliament will need to think about if they want a regulation, if it means less privacy. And I don't think we should um, accept that that's not the purpose of the privacy regulation to actually um, protect uh, citizens less well. So I don't know if ever it will come and I don't know when. <laughs> but as I was saying, we have a framework in place um, that has quite some details. It also has a lot of opening clauses. So basically what the regulation would change is more uh, and more level rules. More rules uh, would be specifically uh, apply at a European level. That's what, what would change. So under the current situation, a lot of exceptions are just regulated nationally. Um, that's one thing that, that is a difference. But otherwise, as I said, uh, the over-the-top surfaces will come in the scope of the current uh, directive as well. So there is not actually a compelling need uh, to, to have this reform. Yes? Uh, very fine. I don't know. The same as the Indian question back here. Uh, track uh, with walls. Uh, uh, would you see, if you don't have the payment authority, but you see a service where you are very, very uh, transparent with what you track, how you track, you have agreements around it, you are very, very transparent. Could you then, how is this discussion then around the, the cookie boards? I mean, this is a service where you track, but you are very transparent and you for free. Could you, in any situation, see these walls of how did the discussion go in around that topic? So, what is possible is um, if you collect anonymized data, right? So, you can. Um, you can record information on who accesses what websites, and I think you can even uh, correlate them, follow them around, as long as it is not personally identifiable. So you would need to anonymize the data. For example, you anonymize the IP address. Um, you would have a um, well, a, a, a unique identifying number that would change with every. Um, visit. So if you make sure that it is not um, personally identifiable, um, I think it, it is an acceptable um, policy to be able to evaluate um, some information on the use of, of the website. It decreases the, the possibilities, um, certainly, um, but that's the price of privacy. Do you have any other questions? Well, so I would like to thank you for your attention. And if you're interested in following the latest developments, there aren't so many on your privacy, but um, yes, I work on um, digital liberties in general in the um, committee on civil liberties and also in the Legal Affairs Committee. So if you're interested in uh, finding out more about my work or following it or uh, contacting me, um, feel free to do so. And um, thank you for your kind attention. <laughs>